The plays were short, obviously, seven plays in the course of an evening. Um, not much more than mass recitations on political subjects. Four of them were written by Canadians. Uh, one was on a police killing of a man being while he, was, while he was being evicted in Montreal. Two came from American workers groups, and one from a Brit from an English worker, working, uh, workers group. Uh, the subjects for these plays included eviction, so obviously the one about the man in Montreal included uh, the, 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 the plight of people who were getting turfed out of their homes during the, the, the Depression, the plight of farmers, and also uh, international anti-imperialism. So one of the plays written by a Canadian was actually called War in the East, and that was one about the Japanese aggression in China and in Manchuria at the time. Um, and that's one of those sort of wishful thinking ones where the Japanese soldiers at the end realize that their real brothers on the other are the Chinese soldiers and not their Japanese, uh, Japanese generals. So that's uh, one of those. And the other one was uh, the, British, uh, uh, the British chant that they, uh, that they used was, uh, was one on workers' rights on docks in India. So there was a real sense of both uh, national pride on a certain kind of a level and development and this kind of sense of, of a Canadian perspective, but also a, a very uh, globalized sense about the working class. Um, they performed in labor halls, in picket lines, etc., etc., etc. According to the, the memoirs, one of their favorite most stops on the tour was a picket line at a cannery strike in St. Catharines, um, where they performed. And uh, it being the Depression, the, the owners of the factory could uh, easily hire scabs to cross the picket lines. And of course, the, the strikers would be uh, assaulted or arrested if they interfered in any way. And apparently, these, uh, these, it was apparently mostly women, mostly Ukrainian women who were working in this cannery at the time. And their tactic for stopping the scabs was they would take paper bags, fill them up with pepper, blow them up, and have them taught. And when a scab walked by, they pop the paper bag in the in the scab's face so they would start to sneeze and cry. Um, and that, and of course, that meant they were touched. Um, the mayor of St. Catharines accused the, you know, complained in the papers about outside agitators, and police visited the Workers' Experimental Theatre Company and suggested that they leave town, which they did. Um, I think one of the interesting notes about these brief tours, which is they were a couple of weeks uh, able to be driven from Toronto in one car, so all the way around to St. Catharines, um, and then, the, uh, then the, the other one, the second one went down to Windsor and back, and then the third one coincided with a march on Ottawa and ended up in Ottawa with the unemployed workers' hunger strike in, uh, in, in 1933. One of the interesting notes of these tours that I found when I was researching this is the recognition that there was already a strong ethnic community that was versed in this kind of work and receptive to it. That the Workers' Experimental Theatre received a strong support from Ukrainian, Finnish, and German-Jewish uh, German left-wing groups, uh, often in the form of rehearsal space, local organization, uh, halls to perform in, uh, the audience of these groups, and so on and so forth. And the, the groups in the West often talked about how they would find, the, when they sort of put out a casting call, that usually the best people that they found were these people from these, the Finnish group or the Ukrainian group um, who, were, who were living in that area. Um, we, we tend to forget, I think, that, that's a, that there's a strong left-wing European tradition of, uh, of organization and cultural work in that kind of a way. We, I, I, I sort of thought, oh right, there's all sorts of Ukrainian labor halls all over Ontario. And you think, oh, they sort of lost their connection to left-wing kinds of activities and cultural activities. But uh, this was, and I think for the, for the Toronto group, this was a bit of an eye-opener, as it was for me, being a Toronto centric. Um, is this idea that there was a strong community in these, these smaller groups available to be mobilized on a certain kind of a level. Um, just, I wanted to uh, briefly sort of do a little bit of a, a personality, the cult of personality sort of talk, but two of the people who were uh, highly involved with this uh, group in this period of time. Um, the, one, the first is Toby Bryan, who wrote the memoir Stage Left. Uh, she was a woman from Toronto who had loved theatre when she was in high school. She actually went to Central Tech um, and had a, an inspirational uh, theatre teacher, actually was a, a very important member of the Canadian theatre world at the time, a man named Herman Vodin. Um, who was extremely important in the development of Canadian theatre uh, from a bourgeois level. 
um, and, he, uh, and he inspired her. Um, she went to New York to study at a left-wing Jewish art school called Artef, uh, which was a very um, strong, uh, highly uh, developed, highly uh, artistic, you know, highly skilled group that was strongly left-leaning. Um, and she had had the opportunity there when she was in New York, which seemed to have made a lasting impression on her, one of the, the leading Ger uh, German-American uh, agitprop groups called the Proletbühne, which was a proletarian theater based in New York that performed well, primarily in Germany, I understand. Um, and they did shows like the 15-minute Red Review. That was their, kind of one of their sort of uh, big sort of ideas. Um, she participated in the formation of the, uh, both, uh, she came into the Progressive Arts Club a little bit later, but she uh, was in the formation of the Workers' Experimental Theatre. She goes on, she went on, on all these tours, and she becomes a leading actress organizer in the Theatre of Action. So she goes on to become one of the sort of central figures in the Theatre of Action from 1935 to 1940. Uh, after the war, she stayed active in theatre, uh, pioneered drama programs for children and became a teacher, and her husband actually, um, uh, Oscar Ryan wrote uh, theater reviews in the Canadian Tribune for 35 years after the war. So this, this, this couple very strong in sort of leftist cultural circles. Um, and the other personality is a woman named Myrtle Eugenia Watts. And Myrtle Eugenia Watts was known as Jean, but actually wasn't known as Jean. She was known as Jim. So in, in all of this stuff, it's like Jim Watts. Like Jim Watts, but Jim Watts was a woman. Um, and she was a wealthy, uh, she was from a wealthy family in Streetsville, um, and she acted as a very strong motivating force, uh, both from the force of her character and the size of her pocketbook. Um, so she was, uh, she was very important on both levels, apparently, and she also had, she was very important because she was, she was really, in some ways, the link between the, the university-educated, literate sort of uh, uh, group and the working class people. She was one of the people who actually had ins with both set with both groups of people and brought them together. Um, people speak of her as having enormous personal energy and charisma. That she was one of those people who can get you to do anything. You know, sort of you have to do this. Okay, I'll do it. Um, as well, she actually uh, and so she was actually the person who connected up with um, people like Stanley Ryerson, Dorothy Livesay, and Earl Burney, who had all been uh, involved in somewhat in leftist circles during this period of time. Um, from a financial point of view, she owned a car. So she was the, she allowed, she was actually the car owner that the car went on tour with. Um, and she also acted on the, in that tour. Uh, in 1935, she went to New York to study at the group theater. So she is in some ways one of the direct connections to uh, this sort of new aesthetic that was coming up. And she was very proud of the fact that she had studied with uh, Ilya Kazan. She actually studied personally with Ilya Kazan. Um, when she returned to, to uh, Toronto in 1935 or 6, she financed the publishing of uh, the, one of the leading leftist literary reviews of the late 1930s called New Frontier, uh, which is where uh, people like Dorothy Livesay and Stanley Ryerson, a lot of their work is actually published. Um, she went to Spain in 1937 as, uh, as the reporter for the, communist, the Canadian communist uh, newspaper. She quit that job to join the uh, Mackenzie Papineau Brigade. She was the only woman in the Mackenzie Papineau Brigade and only one of four or five women in the International Brigades. Um, and she was an ambulance driver uh, for the, uh, in the Mackenzie Papineau uh, Brigade. And then uh, in 1939, she spent about eight or ten months working with Spanish refugees in France. She enlisted in the Canadian Army and was a trained uh, members of the Women's Army Corps throughout the sec Second World War. And after the war, she became very active in uh, one, of the, one of the leading feminist anti-war movements of the 60s and 70s, the Voice of Women. So she's a, a real force throughout this sort of 40 years of uh, sort of leftist kind of uh, cultural work in Canada.